Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for being here. I, I know what you all are thinking. It's Saturday night, and why am I here listening to a lawyer talk about religion? So uh, how can I believe anything this man says? So um, uh, really, uh, my talk tonight, and Ken Bees asked me to come up with a, a title and a topic. I came up with uh, the title, A Baha'i Exaltation of Christianity and the Need for Renewal. Um, why? Because there's just a lot of great stuff in the Baha'i faith that talks about how great Christianity is. And uh, being a Christian who became a Baha'i, it's good that we're reminded of that and looking at that and looking at Christianity, uh, we can see, I think, my belief is we can see a reflection of, of ourselves, where we've come from, where we want to go, and that centers us on this, this notion of a, a need for renewal, which involves thinking about the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven coming upon the earth and what Baha'is do in terms of building the kingdom. Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I'm stubborn, uh, I'm skeptical, I'm analytical. Um, I'm not analytical because I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer because I'm analytical. It's not, not so much a lawyer thing, it's just kind of a, you know, I, I'm slow and I need to go through the building blocks and I've done that uh, with my own journey in religion and uh, Religion is an intensely personal thing. So uh, the beauty I've got as a Baha'i is you don't have to believe what I'm saying. I'm not here. It's not my job to convince anyone of anything. You just present it, and it's up to each person to do their own investigation and find out what they find for themselves. I'm just here to sort of offer some notes from my own journey, from my own curiosity of uh, what I studied. <coughs> um, Tonight, we're talking about Christianity and the Baha'i faith. I'd like to kind of put that in context. I think of the faith as a, a diamond with many facets. Uh, one of those facets is the faith's Christian heritage. There are other facets, there are other religions. I came from a Christian background, so this is the one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I literally could and probably would just sit and ramble about this all night, which I'm not gonna do. I'm gonna try to talk for maybe 40-ish minutes, and then if you have a question or something, um, we'll do questions and answers and go from there. Um, uh, first, I'd like to talk about the Baha'i view of Christians and what do Baha'is think about Christians. Uh, Baha'is hold Christians in the highest regard, and I say that not only from a social and practic practice perspective, but doctrinally, in terms of what the Baha'i writings say. Abdul Baha was the son of Baha'u'llah. Uh, Baha'is called him the master. He was the center of the covenant. Baha'is view what he wrote as part of our holy writings. What Abdul Baha said about Christians is we can see in the letter he wrote in response to what a Christian wrote to him. And what, he, what a Christian wrote to Abdul Baha uh, he started his letter saying, I am a Christian, and then went on with what his questions were. Here's an excerpt of Abdul Baha's response. Thou didst begin thy letter with a blessed phrase, saying, I am a Christian. Oh, would that all were truly Christian. It, I'll just stop right there. Isn't it interesting that uh, the center of the covenant of the Baha'i faith said, Oh, would that all were truly Christian. I'll go on. It is easy to be a Christian on the tongue, but hard to be a true one. Today, some 500 million souls are Christian, but the real Christian is very rare. He is that soul from whose comely face there shineth the splendor of Christ, and who showeth forth the perfections of the kingdom. This is a matter of great moment, for to be a Christian is to embody every excellence there is. I think that's worth repeating. To be a Christian is to embody every excellence there is. If you think about that, what, what is there good that's not in a true Christian? That statement doesn't really leave room for anything. A true Christian embodies every excellence there is. When I say when we as Baha'is can reflect on Christianity and hope to see a mirror of ourselves, I think we see the same thing. Uh, how many of us in this room as Baha'is don't know that it's easy to be a Baha'i on the tongue, but hard to truly be a Baha'i? You know, I mean, who, who in here is willing to stand up and say, you know, I got it perfecto? 
you know, I, I venture to say that, that everyone is here in the same boat. Uh, we're, we're trying to do our best. We're trying to be a true Baha'i. And I think that goes, is true for our Christian brothers and sisters, too. Very few are going to stand up and claim perfection. Everyone's trying to do their best. But that best is not only good enough, it embodies every excellence there is. We are all striving to do our best to reflect all of these spiritual qualities that one should reflect. You're going to find that this concept of the kingdom is a recurring theme tonight. I think that's worth emphasizing in this quote as well. Abdul Baha said, The real Christian is very rare. He is that soul from whose comely face there shineth the splendor of Christ, and who showeth forth the perfections of the kingdom. Those same excellences, those per same perfections, this kingdom of God. Baha'is believe that those perfections are shining forth in all the major religions of the world. What do Baha'is think about Jesus Christ? Uh, Shoghi Effendi was the grandson of Abdul Baha. He was the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And in his writings, he wrote the following paragraph, which I don't want to sit and read to you all night, but I can hardly talk about Christianity without sharing this with you. So indulge me. Uh, As to the position of Christianity, let it be stated without any hesitation or equivocation its divine origin is unconditionally acknowledged, that the sonship and divinity of Jesus Christ are fearlessly asserted, that the divine inspiration of the gospel is fully recognized, that the reality of the mystery of the immaculacy of the Virgin Mary is confessed, and the primacy of Peter, the prince of the apostles, is upheld and defended. The founder of the Christian faith is designated by Baha'u'llah as the Spirit of God, is proclaimed as the one who appeared out of the breath of the Holy Ghost, and is even extolled as the essence of the Spirit. His mother is described as that veiled and immortal, that most beauteous countenance, and the station of her son eulogized as a station which hath been exalted above the imaginings of all that dwell on earth. Whilst Peter is recognized as one whom God has caused the mysteries of wisdom and of utterance to flow out of his mouth. I've learned <clears throat> in my journey that there is a common misperception that Baha'is don't believe in the virgin birth. Uh, I found that out there. I just wanted to dispel that. It's simply not the case. Um, there is a misperception as well that the Baha'i faith somehow seeks to lower or lessen the station of Jesus Christ. That is also not the case. Baha'u'llah himself wrote this about Jesus. Thou hast dealt with the children of the Apostle of God as neither Ad hath dealt with Hud, nor Thamud with Sali, nor the Jews with the Spirit of God, referring to Jesus, the Lord of all being. The Lord of all being is a pretty broad and pretty powerful statement. It, it's an, uh, and if you go through the Baha'i writings, Michael Sauer has written quite a book just talking about the way that Baha'is have looked at Jesus Christ. But my favorite and the one that's closest to my heart really is this statement here, that Baha'u'llah talks about Jesus Christ as the Lord of all being. Um, why is that part important to me as a Christian who's become a Baha'i? <clears throat> Let me go backtrack and share a little personal story. Um, I heard about the Baha'i faith when I first met my wife. Uh, we weren't married at the time. and. Uh, uh, I, uh, I remember seeing the ring on her finger with the Baha'i symbol, which is a symbol I had never ever seen and seemed kind of odd to me. And then she said, you know, have you heard of the Baha'i faith? And no, I had not. Um, and uh, moved here when I was young, but back and forth to Kentucky, and I'm from a Protestant background and didn't hear a lot about other religions, although I knew the major world religions. and. Um, you know, I uh, visited my wife's parents' house and they had a picture of uh, Abdul Baha on the wall and some tapestries with Arabic writing and it was surprising to me uh, and I didn't know what to make of it. Um, and uh, not shocking, but it, it, it sort of pushed my comfort zone. And um, I had read the Bible and I had sort of my own notions of Christianity uh, developing. And um, 
I wouldn't say that I was fiercely loyal to any particular Christian denomination, but I would say that I was and am fiercely loyal to Jesus Christ. And that loyalty, uh, what led to what I now see, is somewhat, a, I don't know, maybe stubbornness, maybe fear, maybe just loyalty, and that's how it is and how I was built. Um, one of the better examples of this is when we got married on our honeymoon, we decided we would want to go to some religiously significant places, so we did an ecumenical honeymoon, part in Jerusalem, part at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa and Akka. And um, I was a non-Baha'i there, and there's a great moment where my wife's opening the gates at Baji, where the Shrine of Baha'u'llah is, saying, I'm not saying you have to become a Baha'i, but I think someday you're going to. You ought to appreciate this visit. So it was kind of funny. And uh, I, uh, I mean, I remember some contemplative moments walking around the Shrine of Baha'u'llah. And um, we happened to be there on the commemoration of the ascension of Baha'u'llah. And I, I do remember being there with sort of all the Baha'i pilgrims, uh, pretty much a lot of prayer going on. And I had, someone had loaned me a Baha'i prayer book. And I remember reading the prayers, but I'd never read the last sentence because I didn't want to have said a prayer of another religion other than Christianity. I didn't want to be disloyal to Jesus. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't, that's not, you know, funny. It's just, you know, we are all built differently, and we all have, you know, the way we are, and we all have our process that we have to go through. And I needed to know how Baha'is prayed. And I needed to do so without stepping out of my understanding of my relationship with God and my relationship with Jesus. And I was like that for a long time. And I finally, even before I became a Baha'i, I got to the point where, you know, then I'd find like start with a short Baha'i prayer and I'd then kind of go through with a fine tooth comb. All right, is anything in here? inconsistent with what I believe. Is anything in here inconsistent with Christianity? And um, so that's what I did. And I would, you know, find one. All right, this one's a safe one. Okay, I can say that. Even if they're wrong, it's a good prayer. You know, hey. And, uh, <laughs> but as time went on, I kept finding it harder and harder to find a prayer I had a problem with. And that got really interesting. Um, and, uh, Time went on, I continued to study. Um, I continued to learn more and clear up some of the misconceptions I had with Christianity. What, uh, what I'm talking to you guys about tonight are some of my greatest hits of uh, what I found in the Baha'i writings that um, affirmed what I hoped the Baha'i faith was, which was an extension of what I believed as a Christian, not as any particular denomination, but, uh, and not a counter to it or abrogation to it, something different. I, I bristle, I still do, when people ask me uh, or say, you converted to the Baha'i faith. Um, I don't feel like I did. I know that there's people that you know, you very clearly converted to the Baha'i faith, and that's fine. But for me, I didn't convert to anything. I just continued on with the path that I knew as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'll come more to that later, but I don't see it as a conversion. Um, other statements, Baha'u'llah talks about Jesus is the position of absolute perfection. Uh, Abdul Baha affirms that Jesus, uh, that Jesus was the Word of God. Um, Baha'u'llah stated that about Jesus Christ. We testify that when he came into the world, he shed the splendor of his glory upon all created things. Through him the leper recovered from the leprosy of perversity and ignorance. Through him the unchaste and wayward were healed. Through his power, born of Almighty God, the eyes of the blind were opened and the soul of the sinner sanctified. We bear witness that through the power of the word of God, every leper was cleansed, every sickness was healed, every human infirmity was banished. He it is who purified the world. Blessed is the man with a face beaming with light hath turned towards him. Baha'is do believe that Jesus saves. Baha'is do believe that Jesus came for the salvation of mankind. 
and Baha'is believe that, that Jesus and God didn't leave the world alone and that nothing has happened for the last approximately 2,000 years. Baha'is believe that even though other things have happened today, now, in this room, Jesus Christ is still relevant. Abdul Baha wrote, See how many conquering kings there have been, how many statesmen and princes, powerful organizers, all of whom have disappeared, whereas the breezes of Christ are still blowing. His light is still shining. His melody is still resounding. His standard is still waving. His armies are still fighting. His heavenly voice is still sweetly melodious. His clouds are still showering gems. His lightning is still flashing. His reflection is still clear and brilliant. His splendor is still radiating and luminous. And it is the same with those souls who are under his protection and are shining with his light. True Christians still shine with the light of Jesus Christ. True Christians still are under his protection, as we all are under his protection, I believe. The Baha'i faith has no clergy. Some of you may, uh, new to the faith, or, or some of you here visiting may not know that, but we have no clergy in the Baha'i faith. That is one difference in our religion and Christianity. It's interesting to see what Baha'u'llah has written about the clergy. He wrote in uh, what's sometimes referred to as the tablet to the Christians. It's called the Law Yaktas, the most holy tablet. I kind of liked that, that the most holy tablet in the Baha'i faith was the tablet to the Christians. But you know, that's my stubbornness and hard-headedness. It wouldn't be so great if I was a Buddhist, but nonetheless, <laughs> that's how it is. Um, Baha'u'llah wrote in, this, in the Most Holy Tablet, O concourse of bishops, ye are the stars of the heaven of my knowledge. Baha'u'llah says, and understand when he's writing here, we believe he's speaking with the voice of God. Bishops, Ye are the stars of the heaven of my knowledge. I wish, no, I wouldn't say I wish God would say that about me because that's never going to happen. I'm not going to get there, but that's pretty neat. I mean, that's a, that's a nice way to refer to somebody. You are the stars of the heaven of my knowledge. Baha'u'llah goes on now. My mercy desireth not that ye should fall upon the earth. My justice, however, declareth this is that which the Son hath decreed, speaking of what Jesus is in the Gospel. And whatsoever hath proceeded out of his blameless, his truth-speaking, trustworthy mouth can never be altered. This is an interesting statement because as the stars fall to the earth, uh, my understanding is that Baha'u'llah is referring to the fact that we are now, as a religion, moving to a point where we don't have individual clergy and that's because all are called upon to act as clergy, to minister to everyone, to exemplify the religion and to aid and assist, that to be educated, to read the writings every day as Baha'is are told to do. And Baha'u'llah says here, my mercy desireth not that ye should fall upon the earth. These stars of the heaven of God's knowledge, there's this hesitation, I don't want it to happen, but it has to happen. In just, the, my justice says, and why? Whatsoever hath proceeded out of his blameless, his truth-speaking, trustworthy mouth can never be altered. It's another interesting thing in the holy writings of the Baha'i faith that nothing that Jesus said can ever be altered. Baha'u'llah goes on to talk about monks. O concourse of monks, if ye choose to follow me, I will make you heirs of my kingdom. Think for a minute what Baha'u'llah says if you don't follow. Okay, this is what he says. If ye transgress against me, I will, in my long suffering, endure it patiently, and I verily am the ever forgiving, the all merciful. Talk about the Bible for just a second. Before Abdu'l-Baha, 
uh, Abdul Baha spoke uh, in London and he spoke in a church and before he left the church he went up to the Bible that had been used by the pastors in the church for many years and he wrote in his own hand very quickly in his uh, native Farsi and it says in, the, in his own native I'll just read it to you uh, he wrote the words in his own native Persian the translation being added as follows this book is the holy book of God of celestial inspiration it is the Bible of salvation the noble gospel it is the mystery of the kingdom and its light is the divine bounty the sign of the guidance of God that's what Abdul Baha said about the Bible that actually in recent years has come to be more and more significant to me I don't know how many here have followed the ages long debates and critical analysis of the you know the accuracy of the Bible uh, but I've read a bit more of it in recent years and, and with some Christian friends of mine it's been sort of a center of debate and this whole notion back and forth between the Catholic Church and the Protestants where Protestants are saying that you know we have the Bible we have the Word of God we don't have a need for this this institution and you have, I, I, I came to understand and was surprised to understand that you have the Catholic Church on the other side saying, well, you can't necessarily know that everything in there you have is exactly accurate in the way it was. You need the apostolic tradition to go along with it. And that you have these parts of Christianity kind of poised against each other in terms of the accuracy or of the Bible and, and where it is. As a Baha'i, I found it pretty comforting that uh, I didn't have to get too uh, deep or embroiled in that debate because I have a confirmation that the Bible is what it purports to be and I don't really need to get into or, or you know this particular phrase here what the difference is here's what Baha'u'llah himself wrote in the Kitab Ikan, the Book of Certitude we have also heard a number of the foolish of the earth assert that the genuine text of the heavenly gospel doth not exist among the Christians that it hath ascended unto heaven. How grievously they have erred. How oblivious of the fact that such a statement imputeth the gravest injustice and tyranny to a gracious and loving providence. How could God, when once the day star of the beauty of Jesus had disappeared from the sight of his people and ascended unto the fourth heaven, cause his holy book, his most great testimony amongst his creatures, to disappear also? <coughs> Baha'u'llah says, we have the Bible. All right, so you're thinking the obvious question. If Jesus is perfect, if what he taught is perfect, if we have the Bible, if Christians embody every perfection there is, why another religion? Right? What's the purpose? Why would why Baha'i faith? Why another religion? It's a good question. It's a question I've knocked around for a long time. Um, Here's what Abdu'l-Bahá pointed, pointed out. Had the followers of the Lord Christ had continued to follow out these principles with steadfast faithfulness, there would have been no need for a renewal of the Christian message, no necessity for a reawakening of his people, for a great and glorious civilization would now be ruling the world and the kingdom of heaven would have come on earth. That, that's an interesting uh, passage to me, and it's one I like a lot because it affirms the fact that there's nothing wrong with the message of Christ. There was nothing imperfect about it. It's not a do-over. It's not a, it's wrong, therefore, you need a different message. Abdu'l-Bahá uses these words, no need for a renewal, no necessity for a reawakening and the kingdom of heaven would have come on earth. There's a difference between new and renewal and reawakening. The kingdom of heaven coming on earth. Uh, Baha'is have a unique view about the coming of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Baha'is don't believe that this is something that just happens instantaneously. Baha'is believe that it is a process and it's one that it's a process that's measured in centuries and it is a process of strenuous and ardent effort 
to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it's a process that Baha'is are engaged in. Briefly, uh, that process involves the kinds of things that we've already talked about in terms of reflecting on the Christian message. First of all, an internal process, building the kingdom of heaven within. Christ himself talks about the kingdom is within you. It's building those spiritual qualities within, um, within ourselves so that we can reflect the perfections of spirituality and that God wants us to perfect. Once we can perfect those, as we try to perfect those within um, ourselves, we try to do that in a community-wide level. In a community, we try to have a community that reflects those same perfections. And then finally, that is spread throughout the, the world, and Baha'is are trying to build this around the world. It's not a negative reflection on Christianity. It's not even a negative reflection on the followers of, Christ, uh, of Christianity. It, it's a fact of how it is, that over time, over 2,000 years, we have numerous denominations uh, not only of, of Christianity, of other religions, that there is a need for a refreshing and a renewal, and this is a refreshing and a renewal that's even talked about in the Bible, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, Christ even said, I have much to say, but you cannot bear it now. Uh, that's a phrase I think about a lot lately, because um, there's a parallel in the Baha'i writings. Christ said, I have much to say, but you cannot bear it now. And in the Baha'i writings, there's a story of Baha'u'llah by a river having written a tablet and then throwing it into the water. And I imagine these pages flipping around, the ink hits the water, the water washes away the ink forever. And I think, why would Baha'u'llah write something and throw it into a river? Did he change his mind? I mean, he knew what he was doing. I think it's the same thing. I think rather than say, I have much to say, but you cannot bear it now, he decided to say that with an action. And it's a lesson for us all. And um, I think back on what it is that Jesus could say to an early Christian that they could not bear now. And when you reflect upon the differences in the way the world is now to where it is then, you know, no slavery, you know, expressly forbidden, you know, equality of men and women, uh, elimination of all forms of racial prejudice. Everyone needs to be educated. Um, unity, the, the types of sacrifices that have to be made to maintain unity in a family and in a community. There are things that are true that would have blown the minds of early Christians. Now, I don't think we get a pass. I think Baha'u'llah told us with throwing the pages into the river that there are things that are true that would blow our minds now too. We are all in this continual process of growth and that's what we're doing. And we are trying to manifest and show these attributes uh, and become, uh, become a Christian, okay? <laughs> embody every excellence there is. Become a true Baha'i, okay? To embody every excellence there is, which I believe. Um, but nonetheless, even though we can't have it all now, we are where we are in the process and we have work to do. Um, Talking about the kingdom, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the Revelation of St. John, John talks about this a new Jerusalem that's coming. He says in, in Revelation 3.12, him who, him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. In chapter 21, verse 12, John also says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Um, I am no religious scholar, um, but I do know how to use Google. <laughs> and... Um, Interestingly enough, in those passages where John talks about the New Jerusalem, the Greek word for new, and I don't speak Greek either, is kainos, not neo. Neo was the word typically translated as new into English. Kainos has a bit of a twist on it. 
it is a word that, according to my sources, means renewed or refreshed. I find that very interesting when compared to the quote we heard earlier about uh, what Abdu'l-Bahá said about the uh, reawakening of the Christian message or the no need for a renewal of the Christian message, no necessity for a reawakening of his people. It's not so much that uh, I don't believe that what I'm saying is that, you know, Christians let us all down. We'd have the whole kingdom of God on, on earth here if they'd steadfastly followed the message. I think what it's saying is, is that man's got to grow. Man's got to progress. Uh, and over time, God's helping him progress. And that message is going to be renewed, and that message is going to be reawakened every time it has to happen. And we're all going to keep working hard until we get it right, until man gets to the point where the kingdom of heaven can be established on earth. This holy city, this new Jerusalem, <coughs> Baha'is believe has arrived uh, in the form of the Baha'i faith. Uh, that this reawaking, this renewal, uh, the Baha'i faith is a blueprint for this uh, kingdom of heaven. Um, I knew I was speaking tonight, obviously, and John Hatcher was giving a talk in uh, Tampa today on Christian issues, so I went and someone in the audience shared a nifty story that's great, but it just kind of like wraps up the whole second half of what I was going to talk about in about 90 seconds. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll sum up the rest of it right here with this. Uh, he tells a funny story uh, of these people, these devoted believers, who are uh, awaiting the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. And they're waiting. And one day, a box, smallish box, falls out of the sky and lands in a field, clearly labeled kingdom of heaven. Everybody's pretty surprised by this so they don't know what to do, so they get together their uh, most respected religious leaders and tell them to go check it out and inspect it and come back. And the guys come back and they say, you know, we got good news and bad news. What's the good news? It really is the kingdom of heaven. What's the bad news? It's a do-it-yourself kit. <laughs> so that's, that's really the message I've got uh, tonight in terms of a, a, a difference between the way Baha'is see the kingdom of heaven and the way I perceive the bulk of Christianity perceives it. We don't think an event is going to happen instantaneously where God uh, exerts his will on human affairs and establishes that. We believe that God uh, exerts his will in human affairs through actions that seemed meaningless, if not yeah, totally meaningless at the time. However, in retrospect, as we look at them, the significance becomes more and more apparent. Um, as you try to figure this out, as a, a Christian, it's tough. I remember, and this is going to sound weird, but I'll just be honest. I, you know, I remember walking outside, you know, do you look at the trees to try to see if the message has been refreshed, renewed, reawakened? Where is the signal? Where does one turn? Um, Baha'u'llah writes in his writings uh, that one of the saddest things, and I'm totally paraphrasing, is thinking of the person who is yearning, looking for God, and does not know where to turn. And I think we, we see that in this day and age, and I think we've seen that in other ages to pass. History repeats and it continues, and this notion of Baha'is building the kingdom, this strenuous effort, um, we're trying to set forth, turn the world into a platform that further spiritual development, that help. It's a collective salvation of the whole world. Uh, my talk tonight's not about salvation, but there is a Lutheran priest, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was uh, killed in a concentration camp for opposing Hitler. And he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship that I find just amazing. And in it, he said that you know, the question of salvation is the ultimate only question. And truly great minds think of nothing else. Uh, 
the Baha'i faith concerns itself with this notion of salvation, but uh, as Baha'is, we think of the salvation of the individuals, I believe, my understanding is, is that it's as a given. We are concerned with trying to save the whole planet and trying to m make the spiritual advancement of the whole planet occur through justice, through equality, through education, through access to resources, through the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. Uh, Abdul Baha wrote about this kingdom that Baha'is are trying to build. He said, O ye beloved of God, O ye children of his kingdom, verily, verily, the new heaven and the new earth are come. The holy city, New Jerusalem, hath come down from on high in the form of a maid of heaven, veiled in beauteous and unique, and prepared for reunion with her lovers on earth. He also wrote, The descent of the New Jerusalem is the heavenly religion which secures the prosperity of the human world and is the effulgence of the illumination of the realm of God. What religion is Abdul Baha referring to? I'll leave that as something to think about. If I read it again, the descent of the New Jerusalem is the heavenly religion which secures the prosperity of the human world and is the effulgence of the illumination of the realm of God. I think of that religion as the true religion. I'm not really concerned with what name you put on it. Baha'u'llah wrote about this religion. With faces beaming with joy, hasten ye unto him. This is the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Let him that seeketh attain it, and as to him that hath refused to seek it, Verily, God is self-sufficient above any need of his creatures. Uh, that is my favorite passage in all of the Baha'i writings, because I think it sums up the point that the truth is the truth. In this world, we speak words, molecules vibrate, they hit our ear, we hear it. They're symbols, but that is true. To me, personally, I, I believe I came to believe in Jesus Christ, and I like to sum that belief up by saying that if you prove to me that the Bible is a big fake, all you, can, all you did was get me to call Jesus Christ by some other name. But his reality is still real. Uh, he is there. We have these different religions in the world, but no matter how many religions you have, you can't create another God. There's only God and we're all doing our best. There is a passage in the Bible where uh, one of the disciples comes across some people who are praying to, at an altar and the altar says on it, to an unknown God. And he doesn't scold these people for praying to an altar, to an unknown God. As I read that, he kind of appreciates that they're doing the best with what they know. And he tells them, you who are praying to an unknown God, Come here, let me tell you. I'll tell you how it is. And he tells them the gospel. And he enlightens them and they become Christians and they move on. Now were they totally, you know, was anybody hearing those prayers before they knew? I, don't, I think they were. I think they were doing their best. As I think we all are doing our best. Anyway, I've digressed. Um, there's work to be done. Uh, James said that faith without action is done, is dead. This is a religion of action. It's not a religion of uh, building this kingdom of God so everybody's going to have it. It's all going to be easy. It's about real work to be done and arduous effort to establish this, this society, this kingdom of heaven. Um, Baha'is do have the luxury of being closer in time to the beginning of their religion, some 160 years in, the, in this era. In this dispensation, Baha'is have the luxury of having the actual writings and signed tablets of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi. Uh, there are a number of issues that other religions have that we don't have to grapple with, and then we have our own issues. Um, we talked about a little bit before uh, how I be became a Baha'i, and uh, 
it was over a considerable amount of time and uh, I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. Most of, well, I, I wasn't going to change religions without being aware of it and studying and at one point in my life I wanted to know as much about Christianity and the Baha'i Faith as I could so that any question anyone asked I would be able to answer it and tell them how it is. Um, I look back, that's one of the most arrogant things I ever thought in my whole life. Um, I, and and what, it's one of those things where once you get a drop of knowledge you realize there's an ocean there and there just are not enough years in your life nor brain cells in your head that you're going to get there. Um, so I was humbled real quick with that and so then it became just a matter of you know personally uh, getting to what I needed for me and, um, and that was a lot. Uh, I remember a conversation I had with a Baha'i who asked me to tell him on a scale of 1 to 10 where I was in terms of becoming a Baha'i, which was a very funny question to me because that's really an all or nothing proposition, you know, you're not, so, but I said, you know, I'm probably like a 9.8. <laughs> and he said, well, why don't you become a Baha'i and give it a try? And I was, what? I mean, I, to me, he missed the whole point. You know, I need to be, you know, I need to be 10.2, you know. Um, and uh, so a year later, after being at 9.8, um, after, you know, some prayer and whatever, and, and, and study, and uh, I finally became a Baha'i. But that came about, and my reluctance was much, uh, first out of fear, and then not so much fear, and, and kind of as I studied, it was all about loyalty, and it was all about loyalty to Jesus Christ as it is today, although it's now about loyalty to Jesus Christ and Baha'u'llah and the Bab and the rest of the manifestations of God and loyalty to God and where that takes you. My loyalty to uh, Jesus Christ held me back a bit and then propelled me forward. And by holding me back, I mean I wouldn't read a Baha'i prayer. I wouldn't read a Baha'i prayer all the way to the end. Okay, I would, but only certain ones. And I sort of, you know, got my feet wet and could gradually understand. But even so, uh, I would be around Baha'is and look at what they're doing and um, sort of watch. And then the watching turned to kind of observing more closely. Um, but, you know, I wasn't going to be... Uh, you know, really a part of this. I'm a friend of Baha'i. They're nice, that kind of thing. And uh, but you know, out of my loyalty to to, to Jesus and Christianity, I'm, I'm not going to get too involved in that. I'm not going to study really too much. Um, a couple things happened. One, I remember someone asked me, "What does Baha'u'llah ask you to do that is different than what Jesus Christ asks you to do?" Uh, I'm still trying to find an answer to that question um, because I don't think there is any difference. But where the whole loyalty thing got interesting is, um, although some things sort of changed, um, my, my curiosity turned into actually studying, my sort of watching turned into a critical observance. Um, the, the worry about being disloyal didn't turn into anything. It just went upside down. All of a sudden, I realized that I had had my nose in the books and I wasn't doing anything. I was kind of like, I had my faith, I was good, and then I was waiting for that instantaneous kingdom of God to happen whenever it happened, if it happened in my lifetime or not. Meanwhile, because I was observing and because I was now studying instead of merely curious, I see Baha'is around me madly working to eliminate racial prejudice, madly working uh, to ensure equality of men and women madly working to maintain unity in their own community and you know worrying about how where they misstepped and whatever and yes I'm not saying this doesn't happen in the Christian community but this was I was seeing this within the framework of that blueprint uh, in the box and one day I woke up and I felt disloyal for not doing that work and I felt that way the next day and the next month. And all of a sudden, I started feeling disloyal to Jesus for not going out and becoming a Baha'i. And that was quite a weird feeling. Um, and a hard one to explain, but I'm trying. Anyway, uh, so I became a Baha'i, 
And then I realized that although the Baha'i faith is the second most geographically widespread religion in the world, there aren't that many Baha'is in the world. So arguably I was an early adopter and you know we go from there. It's like the, there's this old adage the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, the second best time is now. So you know here you are, you get there how you get there and you go forward. Um, I sort of started off by saying you got a lawyer talking to you about religion, how can you believe a word he says? Uh, I'll answer that. Um, I answer that and I would, I would answer that with the way I approach the question from a Christian and that is uh, the only way to analyze anything religiously um, if you have established a relationship with Jesus is by looking at the Bible. To use the tests that Jesus gives you in the Bible and apply them. Uh, one of those, I think one of the foremost of those, is by their fruits shall you know them. A good tree gives good fruits, a bad tree gives bad fruits, fruits there's nothing else. So um, I've been, I'm here on the stage with the lights on me. Uh, I now offer just a little bit of putting everybody else on the spotlight here. Uh, anyone who's in the audience who's not a Baha'i, don't be, don't watch, observe. Look at the Baha'is in the room. Look at who you know who is a Baha'i. Look at the Baha'i community and judge. Judge. Judge the fruits. And, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, look at the individual and, you know, when you see the imperfection, look at what the response is after the imperfection, too. And that's the only way to do it. That's the only way we can, I mean, I think those are the tools that God gives us. And, um, but it's interesting when you walk outside and try to look at uh, has the message been refreshed, renewed, reawakened. Um, okay, that's about all I had, but uh, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to take a stab at an answer of some sort.